But anyway, as I was saying, isn't it great to be here? Aren't we blessed? Aren't we blessed to come together and be with God's people? To be in the presence of Jesus Christ? To spend time with Jesus, meditating on His words and letting them settle into us and shape us into people that we can never be without Him. We can never be what He calls us to be without His teaching, and we can never do it without the help of His Spirit. Isn't it great to come into contact with God again? Each week we come here. And if you're visiting with us, you're welcome. We'd love for you to come back again and then do that again and again. And listen, if you came from 500 miles away, that's okay. You're, you can come back next week. You can do that every week if you want to. It won't bother us. Uh, of course, I'm kidding. Anytime you're in the area, we'd love to have you. But if you live around here, let us get to know you. And please, do come back. Uh, we would love to get to know you and be blessed. And listen, if you haven't started following Jesus Christ yet, there is no better way of life, no more blessed way of life than following Jesus Christ our Lord. There just isn't. And we'd love to talk with you more about that. This morning, we're talking about blessings. They're weird. They're strange blessings that we're going to look at this morning. This is a, a church that's far, far away from here, a church building. Uh, it's actually it's called the Church of the Beatitudes. Um, and it is found at the place where it's very possible that the Beatitudes were first given. I say possible because we really don't know for sure. And I suspect Jesus went around doing this teaching that, that shows up in Matthews 5, 6, and 7. And he did that a lot. Uh, I think this was his bread and butter boilerplate teaching. What is it like to hear Jesus teach? This is it. But I suspect that he did teach on a mountain, and maybe this one. It doesn't look much like a mountain in that picture, but it is. You can't really see the change in elevation as the mountain heads down into the Sea of Galilee, but it is entirely possible that's the same building there, and it's entirely possible that it's built on the very site where he stood. Of course, that was long before he stood there. I mean, long after he stood there. I put that picture in front of you so that you can imagine standing there with him sitting there on the hillside where he sat down. And the people gathered together. His disciples came to him. And they began to hear him teach. He teaches the very best way of life that there is. And it's one that we need. We need to come to this mountain as Jesus' disciples again and again and again because it is to this that we are called. We are called to live a life that is completely alien from the life that we are handed by our culture, by our childhood, by our life in this world. He calls us to something that is, comes from outside the world and invades. And it is a rich and wonderful life. But to the heart of Adam, it is a strange one. As that man stood and looked out over the people that were gathered around him, all he wants to do is bless them. It's why he had come why He comes into your life, isn't it? To come into a life broken and make it whole. To come into a heart distorted and bend it back into its proper alignment, its proper shape. To, to convict and transform and change. And when you come to Him, you come to Him and begin to see, receive His blessings. But the truth is, we don't even know what blessedness is. And so before He can give us blessings, He's got to teach us what that even is. He comes with something called a beatitude. You've probably heard that word before. What does that even mean? Well, you might be surprised to know that Jesus is not the only one who threw those around in the ancient world. Blessed are thou, and then fill in the blank, was actually a standard formula, a standard way of talking about what, do, what should my life look like? What am I aiming for? Any wisdom teacher worth their salt is going to put in front of you not just a whole bunch of beliefs about what's real, but ultimately, how do those matter? What kind of life should I live if I want to have the good life? Jesus begins His, his message with these beatitudes so that I can know what, 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 how do I need to align my life? What does it need to look like? In the ancient world, Beatitudes would look something more like blessed are the rich because they have tiny giraffes. That's not true. 
and there is no beatitude that's, I don't know if you've ever seen that commercial, the guy who says, opulence, I has it, you know, and at the end of it, he kisses a tiny giraffe. It's one of the better moments on the earth. Anyway, uh, you know, but if you are really rich, man, you got the good life, right? So blessed are the wealthy because you can have anything you want. Even if it doesn't even exist, you can get it if you're rich enough. Or maybe blessed are the beautiful. You know, because people will do all kinds of things for the beautiful, right? You know, you, life is easy if you're pretty enough. Or maybe blessed are the people who have a really big family. You know, that's what it means to be blessed, is to be surrounded by love, right? I mean, that sounds good, right? Or maybe blessed are the young, because they got their whole life in front of them, and their knees don't hurt. Right? Eh? <laughs> Or, blessed are the healthful, maybe. Blessed, thing, the blessings are things that we want. Blessed is what, blessedness is what makes for a good life. And don't you want to be blessed? When we sing the song, Count Your Many Blessings, what are the things that come into your mind? Very often they're things, aren't they? You know, we talk about how, oh man, yeah, I got a great job, I'm so blessed, or I've got this car, I'm blessed. I'm, well, I got my health. I may not have everything else, but I'm all right. Or, well, I, I have heaven to look forward to. <laughs> what does it mean to be blessed? When we hear Jesus' Beatitudes, we want Jesus to make sense to us. We really do. And so we assume that if Jesus says something is blessed, then it's a good thing. And we look for ways of making these beatitudes into good things. Have you ever heard that done? Have you ever stood in a, in a Bible study, or probably sat, in a Bible study and heard somebody say, blessed are the poor in spirit, and people sit around going, yeah, I want to be poor in spirit. I hope I am someday, whatever that is. But it's, it's got to be good. Humility or some admirable trait is what pure, poor poverty of spirit is. I'll tell you what, Jesus doesn't make any sense at all. Not to our broken, fallen human hearts that wants good for ourselves, that runs from evil as fast as we can, that is afraid to be hurt and wants to, be ple wants to have pleasure, wants to be satisfied. If you come to Jesus with that mind frame about what it means to be blessed, well, he's going to roll a grenade into it and blow it up. I'll tell you the thing that first did it to me is the second of the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who mourn. What we sometimes do with that is we act like there's something after the word mourn, like they mourn about their sins, because that makes sense, see? If I'm going to mourn, I, I need to mourn the fallen world. I, I need to mourn the suffering that's around me. Because he can't mean, blessed are those who mourn, because that's stupid. Because, I mean, have you ever done it? Some of you are doing it right now. How's it feel? I learned to mourn when I was nine. Uh, uh, just a year or so before I, my, my dad died, my grandmother died, and I, I remember my, my mom and dad telling me that we were going to go to a funeral. And I said, is that like a party? They said, well, kind of. They were going to bury my grandmother that day. I was, was a little relieved to have the training because it was just a very short time later that we were doing it again, first for my aunt my dad's sister, and then for my dad. Just nine years old. Listen, I remember singing, in Can to Canaan's land, I'm on my way. It was my dad's favorite hymn. There was a lady behind me singing the tenor line. Women are not supposed to sing that line. I remember being very mad about it. Messing up my dad's song, man. But I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to say goodbye. I didn't even know that I wasn't ready to say goodbye. I couldn't compute it. 
But you know, there's still a place in my heart that I can go to. And I've gone there many times at every major accomplishment in my life. I've gone and revisited that space where I've had to wonder, what would my dad think about me? Would he be happy? Would he be satisfied? Is it enough? But I'll never know. That shadow has been over me my whole life since I was a little bitty kid. And Jesus says, blessed are those who have that experience. Are you, are you kidding? Does anybody want to do this? Blessed are the meek. Okay, well, now that one, though, at least can be good, right? Meekness. That's, that's beautiful. That's desirable. It's even attainable, right? I, I've heard this described as, uh, you know, like great power under control. The metaphor I've heard used for it is a Clydesdale horse. Strong, huge animal, but with a bit in its mouth, being led. Meekness is like that. You, you restrain, and you could do all kinds of things that you don't do. And you're, now, listen, that may be a really good description of humility, but in the prophetic tradition, if you put Jesus side by side with, say, Isaiah and Jeremiah, that isn't meekness. Then when the meek of the earth are described in the prophets, the meek are side by side with the orphan, fatherless, the widow, stranger. If you want to find the meek in our world today, go to the third world. Find the hungry child. What defines meekness in the prophetic tradition is that they are oppressible. You can push them down. There's no one to defend them. No one who speaks for them. And really, you don't have to go to the third world to find the meek, do you? They're here in this culture too. Do you want to trade places with them? They've got nothing, no one to protect them, and they're often mistreated because of it. Does that sound like a blessed life to you? Something you want? Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, there is absolutely no way to make that ugly. Come on, it's beautiful. People who hunger and thirst for righteousness are people who have hearts for God. All they want is God. Sure, I'll give you that. Take just a moment and think with me about Thanksgiving. When is it that you're hungry? Is it at, you know, like 1.30 or 2 in the afternoon when the meal is finally consumed and you're thinking about that second piece of pecan pie, you know, and trying to decide whether there's actually room in there, you know, and you're having to loosen the belt and, the, and you're going, oh my goodness. Or is it at 1 o'clock when the rolls have just come out of the oven and the smell is in the air? Are you hungry when you've eaten or when you haven't? Are you hungry? Are you thirsty when you've been satiated? Or are you thirsty because you want something that you do not have? See, if you want to find those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, sure, that person might fit the bill, but I suspect this person might fit it a little better. Somebody whose life has really gone sideways. And they sit there wishing as they try to go to sleep in the cold that they weren't like what they are. Somebody that we might walk past, maybe on our way to church. And then I look at you and go, I wish that my life was together like that person's life is. See, because they are hungering for it. They long for it. Because they know they don't have it. Now, you and your together life, do you want to trade places with this one? Do you? Does he know what he's talking about? Blessed are the merciful. Now, come on, that's beautiful. Mercy is beautiful. It is. It's gorgeous in theory. You know, as long as you leave mercy in a theoretical realm wherein there is no enemy upon whom to, to exercise your mercy then mercy is something where you're expanding the beauty of the universe. You are releasing joy and wonder. But suggest that we ought to be merciful to somebody like that. Or to a school shooter. To a terrorist. Tell you what, get, get in a time machine. Go back in time 
to 2001, late September, wear a placard that says, forgive Osama bin Laden, and walk around in the financial district of New York. How will you be treated? Will you get out? Will you survive? The thing is, as soon as people encounter an actual need for mercy to be expressed, they don't like it anymore. And if you stand with mercy, which is incidentally standing with God, right? The Lord, the Lord, the God, merciful and gracious. First word to define His character, mercy. You stand with Him, and you can expect the world around you to stand against you. If you call out to forgive an enemy, to be kind to someone that they've got on the ropes and say, no, don't act badly. Be good to them. You'll discover that people don't want mercy. They want justice. And if you stand for mercy against their justice, they will treat you like the one that you're calling for them to have mercy on. You will be mistreated. Blessed are the pure in heart. That's beautiful right up until you encounter somebody who's just a little bit more pure in heart than you are. Because then you don't feel like it's beautiful. Then you feel judged. When I was in college, we had an opportunity to go to New York. I was part of a choir, and the choir had bought tickets to a Broadway show. The Broadway show was going to be like PG-13. Not rated R, PG-13. You know, I was going to have a couple of moments in it that, you know, were... Maybe like mildly risque. Nothing that you couldn't see on television. Okay? We had bought the tickets to the show already. They had come in, and with them came programs. And on those programs were pictures of some of the ladies in the outfits that they were going to be wearing in the show. Um, the show, incidentally, Miss Saigon. You ever, seen, you ever heard of Miss Saigon? It's a famous Broadway musical. But there are some moments where there are prostitutes in it. And, you know, of course to sell the tickets, they're showing those ladies, right? They're on the stage for all of one song, but, you know, it's going to be a little... This is Harding University, a Christian campus. One of the ladies in the choir, when they saw the program, were like, I don't know, guys, I don't, I don't think Jesus would go to this. I don't think we should go. I, I think that those women shouldn't be dressed like that, and I don't think we ought to participate with it. And you know what we did. I mean, it's a, it's a Christian campus, it's a Christian college, you know, choir. We all held hands, and we sang Kumbaya together. And we thanked her, you know, for her leadership and purity of heart. I, I wish. That is not what we did. We savaged her. We made so much fun of her. And I say we, because I, I was part of that. And I, I say that to my shame. <laughs> wow, I really didn't get enough sleep last night. Man. I mean, that's how people who are pure in heart get treated. When they come to you with the call to say, you can do better than this. If you don't want to do better than that, then you will feel judged by their purity, even if they aren't judging you. I know, because she wasn't. She absolutely was not, but she was absolutely mistreated. Anybody want to trade places with her? Would you like to? <laughs> Blessed are the peacemakers. <laughs> By the way, that's not these, okay? Uh, but anybody who thinks that peacemaking is a blessed way of life does not realize how much people like to fight. Incidentally, peacemaking is not troublemaking. Peacemaking is sitting with somebody and being their friend and loving them and being an agent of peace, being peaceful yourself, being non-anxious yourself, and when their anxiety is huge, you lead them to God. But leading somebody who is in a high level of conflict to God will often result, especially if you end up in between two people who are fighting, you know what they'll do? They will stop shooting each other. They will. Just long enough so that both of them can turn the gun on you. Because people don't want peace. They want victory. Sure, I can have peace with that person once I've won. But until then, no sir, don't call for me to lose. You try to make peace. 
that is a very conflicted way of life. They, you will be mistreated. Do you see how all of these are ugly? This man on this mountain is crazy. He absolutely is. I don't know about you. I don't want any of that. I don't want to mourn. I don't want to be mistreated because I'm trying to be a good person. I don't want to do that. What on earth is he even talking about? And why did anybody listen to him pass the introduction to his sermon? Because they stayed. Why did they do it? Well, it's not the circumstances that make sense of things. Because that's not where the blessing found. Blessed are those who mourn. Why are those people blessed? They will be comforted. They will be comforted. Who does that for you? When you find yourself shattered by loss and broken hearted and everything comes tumbling in on you, where do you turn? I can't even comfort myself. Can we give comfort to one another? To some degree that we can, but how do we do it? We speak the promises of God. That's how God is the comforter. So the person who mourns isn't blessed because they're mourning. They're blessed because of the presence of God in their life. And that a person who mourns is stripped of any illusions that they don't need God. When you're knocked back on your heels, you know you need Him and you know your need for Him is desperate. And so you come to Him going, please, God, be with me. And He is. Have you ever found yourself saying, okay, I would never go through that again. But oh, God was so good to me in the middle of that. I wouldn't wish that on my enemies. But I am grateful that God was with me in that. Blessed are the meek. Why? They will inherit the earth. Who has the deed to that? Who can give it to them? You see, this is one of the promises of Jesus of these grand reversals. You make your life about the stuff of this world, in the end you'll lose it all. But if you have nothing and you are knocked down and you cry out to God, not only at the end, but even now God cares for the meek. He takes care of the oppressed. He hears their cry. I would not want to be an oppressor because the Lord listens to the cry of the oppressed. He hears it and He's giving them everything. Who owns everything? God does. It's God in their life that can fulfill that. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Why? They will be satisfied. Where does that satisfaction come from? I want to be a righteous person. Where's the righteousness in my life? It's all God's work. Every bit of it. I may have participated in receiving it, but I did not cause it. It came from Him. He is my bread and drink. He is what satisfies my heart and I can find it nowhere else. Blessed are the merciful. Why? For they will obtain mercy. Who do you most need that from? And mostly you need it from God. And siding with God and saying we should be good to people in this life, no matter whether they deserve it or not. God is saying, that's mine. I'm here. You receive it too. What you wanted to give, I give to you. It comes from Him. Blessed are the pure in heart. Why? They will see God. If you are willing to do the difficult work of trying to be a good person in a world that doesn't want that. And if you will put up with their attacks, you will begin to see God everywhere. And a day will come when if you have preserved your eyes, you will finally use them for what they will for because you will gaze upon God Himself. It's a promise from Messiah. Blessed are the peacemakers. Why? Because everyone will know who your daddy is. They will know that nobody does that except that they walk with God. And yes, this is a true child of God. The blessings don't come from the things in these people's lives. It doesn't come from wretched circumstances. And it doesn't come from people turning on you. It comes from the presence of God. The reason we are blessed is because we are with a blesser. And what Jesus is doing at the very beginning is He's saying, turn your life around. You don't need God because of the things that He can give you. You need God 
Because God in your life, no matter what happens, it can all fall apart. And if God is with you, you will still say, I am a blessed person. God loves me. And I know because I got through that. And don't you know, you've had that experience if you've walked with Jesus, am I right? And don't you know that's the real blessed life? The one that can weather anything and that becomes more than what it is because of the presence of God. There are two blessings on either side there. Blessed are the poor in spirit and blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. And they both have the same blessing. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, who are the poor in spirit? Next time you go to a Bible study, you kind of know the answer to this. Who is more poor in spirit than those who mourn? Right? They don't have any spiritual resources. They don't count on themselves. They have absolute poverty and they know it. The meek, the downtrodden, the broken of the earth. The people who don't count on their own righteousness because in their own eyes they don't have any. They are hungry for what they don't have. Those are the poor in spirit. And who is it that's persecuted for the sake of righteousness? Well, if you're merciful, count on it. If you're pure in heart, it's going to come your way. If you're a peacemaker, you'll be mistreated because all those things align with God and the world is in enmity with God and it will come at you. But to such of the, as these belongs the kingdom of heaven and there is nothing better than that. It's worth whatever you've got to go through to enter. Whatever kind of life you have to live to get to be with Jesus Christ the King is worth it. And not only worth it, blessed. So, how do I get there? How do I get into this kingdom, Jesus? There's one last blessing. He says, blessed are you and all men revile you and speak all manner of evil against you. See, he's changed from the general, blessed are they, blessed are those, and he says, blessed are you. He turns to the people listening to them, which I would say includes you this day. He says, blessed are you. Even if you live in a world that is hostile to you, and if you live Jesus' way, count on that. It'll happen. All the time there will be pressure around you to go along and get along with the people around you, fit into the culture, be like everybody else. But if you will not, and you say, no, I'm going to follow Christ, then you can count on the world being a little bit crazy. Blessed are you who are treated that way on account of me. And that's how you get there. Throw in your lot with Him. Make Him what your life is about. And if you walk with Him, then you are with the blesser and the blessings come from Him. Come what may in this world, He will carry you through it all. He says, rejoice. Rejoice in a world filled with mourning and meekness and, and mistreatment. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. There are things worth more than the things that we sometimes foolishly call blessings. There are things waiting for us that the human mind cannot even imagine. The kind of love and joy and peace that will be ours in eternity is worth whatever sorrow and suffering we must go through here. Be very glad. Why? Because I'm suffering? No, because you've got something to look forward to and you're in good company because in the same way they treated the prophets who were before you. You've made the right choice. The people you admire, those prophets that God walked with, walk with Him as well. This is what it means to be blessed. It's not to have everything line up so that I can be satisfied. Although sometimes God does provide those things. And you shouldn't look at having those things and necessarily say, well, I must be cursed. No. But you've got to look at them as though you don't have them. Because the things that you take with you into eternity is the kind of heart that you have, the kind of ability to love that you've got, and the relationship with God that you have. And those things are eternal. Those are blessings. And you can never lose them. So, do you want a blessed life? Do you want them by His standards? Because so many of us, I think, you know, if we're not careful, if we just look at what He's offering, it's easy to say no. But if you get Jesus with it, man, is it ever worth it? 
Because he is such a good person and good to walk with. If you look into your life today and say, man, my priorities are not lining up with the kind of stuff that he's teaching, but boy, do I want it to be. It may be that you need prayer to get there. This church will pray with you. The Lord will walk with you. Maybe that you came here today and you were carrying burdens that are heavy, but they have nothing to do with blessing or not. Well, then let us know. We want to pray for you. We really do. And if you're not walking yet with this great, wonderful man, well, today's the day to start. If you're subject to the invitation of God, there's room right here. Why don't you come fill that up while we stand?